Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we shall wait a minute or two to let some people join us as they log in. And um, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we're here to um, share with you um, some uh, insights from our partners and in particular um, from our uh, ecclesiastical partner who provides um, credit unions up and down Great Britain with their property and liability insurances. Um, so I'll give it a couple of minutes and then we'll get started. Thank you. Once again, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us here today. Um, I'm going to get, get us started for this afternoon, and uh, we shall have um, a little bit of an agenda to go through just to let you know what to expect and how we'll run the session. <coughs> um, we're going to look at a little bit about Kuna Mutual, um, some housekeeping for the session as well, um, tell you how we um, are uh, um, in uh, partnership with Ecclesiastical Insurance for Credit Unions, Commercial Buildings, Property and Contents, and Liabilities Insurance, and then we'll get to the keynote speaker for this afternoon, David Parkinson, who is um, a risk management surveyor for Ecclesiastical, and he's going to share some insight with us, uh, which will be interesting and highlight some of the things that uh, he sees in the space uh, in relation to claims in particular. <coughs> So the session for everyone's benefit will be recorded for distribution afterwards. Um, use the chat function to send us your questions and um, I'll be fielding those questions at the end with David. And of course, um, follow up contact details are there to get in touch with C Mutual. We have um, a significant number of credit unions that protect their buildings and contents and liabilities with us, um, insured by Ecclesiastical. And um, during the time that we've been operating that programme, we've come across some insights that we think is valuable for uh, to share with the sector. For those that don't know, Kina Mutual has been working with credit unions in Great Britain for almost 50 years. Um, we operate protecting credit unions themselves as businesses, but also their people, staff, directors, and of course, their members. Credit unions, as everyone here will know, are required to have fidelity bond insurance. So we now protect almost 90% of all the credit unions in Great Britain for that required fidelity bond insurance. In the dim and distant past, um, <coughs> we worked with co-op insurance who provided the um, commercial property and contents, buildings and contents insurance for credit unions. But many of you will know that in 2015, uh, the co-op insurance exited that market um, and we were able to uh, source and um, come up with a solution for credit unions that allowed them to um, benefit from continuing to be involved and, and arrange their insurance with uh, C Mutual following the co-op's exit. So how do we do that? Well, when we are sourcing an insurer to work with, we place an awful lot of emphasis on trying to make sure that we partner with credit with insurers that share some of the values of the credit union sector that C Mutual certainly does. We focus on their track record, their values, 
and looking to make sure that they're going to work um, and understand some of the um, unique nature of the credit union sector so that we have products that suit specifically for the risks that credit unions face. And, and in searching for an insurer to provide buildings and contents insurance for Ecclesiastical did stand out from the crowd. Um, they are experts in the um, insurance sector for not for profits and for charities. They're very financially secure and they have an award winning claims team. These things were all important in how we determined which insurer was going to work best for credit unions. Ecclesiastical are owned by a charity. They are a commercial business, but they give a significant proportion of profits to their charitable owner for distribution to good causes and in the marketplace. And uh, they're widely known for their ability to do the right thing and take an, eth an ethical approach. So it seemed to us and has proved to be an exceptionally good fit for our sector, the credit unions. <coughs> so we're, we're really pleased to be delighted and uh, really pleased, sorry, to be welcome David Parkinson from Ecclesiastical to speak with us. I'm grateful for his time and interested to hear and see some insights from David. Um, as I said at the beginning, he's a risk manager surveyor with Ecclesiastical. And one of the things we're going to talk um, in detail about is the significant risk posed to credit unions and businesses in general from water damage, um, which results in one third of all property claims in the UK every year and um, results in over a billion pounds in claims payments per year across um, industry as a whole. Now, <coughs> we've got personal experience of this because unfortunately there have been credit unions up and down the country that have suffered from water damage. And as you can imagine, in particular, areas that causes extensive damage. Um, there's been occasions when credit unions have had their server rooms flooded and it causes um, massive disruption and damage. Uh, so we're grateful for David to come and share some of his expertise in this area. So without further ado, I'll hand over to David. Good afternoon, everybody. Sorry, if you can just bear with me. Um, can you can you hear me? OK, just got one or two uh, technical problems. Can you hear me, David? OK, I'm not seeing any attendees, so I'm not sure uh, who may or may not be able to uh, hear the presentation, but um, sorry, let me just get my uh, PowerPoint up again. Good afternoon, everybody. Apologies again. I'm hoping that uh, you can see uh, the agenda for um, this afternoon. And um, there does seem to be a bit of feedback on the line, so I'm hopeful that um, uh, the audio is coming through all right for you. But um, good afternoon, and uh, once again, thank you for joining today's workshop, where we're going to be exploring the uh, risks of water leaks and some of the things that you can do to uh, try and mitigate. I'll also touch on building valuations at the end of the session, drawing factors. Sorry, um, I think there's still feed, feedback. Um, I don't know whether Bobby or, or Dara can just confirm to me what you're what you're hearing, but um, I've got a, 
about a two minute delay between what I'm saying and what you're you're hearing. We can hear you fine there, David. Are you getting the feedback at your end? No. OK, in which case I will try and block. Right, um, sorry, uh, once again, I turned off my microphone so I can't hear uh, the feedback. Um, I think you can hear me OK um, at your end, so apologies, I'll, I'll start again. Um, so good afternoon and thank you for joining today's workshop, um, exploring the risks of water leaks and some of the things that you can do to mitigate them. Um, I'll touch on building valuation at the end of the session, um, exploring some of the um, factors that influence reinstate costs. I know that's um, a challenge for a number of you. Um, I'll pick up your questions at the end of the session, so if you can raise those using the chat facility um, and uh, I think everybody's microphone and cameras are, are off um, to try and uh, make sure we get the best connection possible. So um, in terms of the agenda for the workshop, we're going to explore um, the scale of the problem in terms of water leaks. We'll look at some of the key risk factors to consider when assessing the potential for water leaks, um, some of the steps that you can take to manage the risk, uh, minimising the potential for loss and also the extent of damage uh, in the event that you are unfortunate enough to, to suffer a loss. Um, and we'll look at some of the risk, mitiga risk mitigation measures that you can um, consider, including um, leak detection and the different types of leak detection that are available. So uh, before we start, just a little bit um, about myself. Um, so I'm David Parkinson, I'm the Risk Management Technical Surveyor at Ecclesiastical Insurance and I've worked in the insurance sector for 33 years. Um, to the last 28 of those within a risk management uh, capacity covering a number of different roles uh, at Ecclesiastical um, and with both some valuation matters for both domestic and larger complex commercial um, risks. Um, ecclesiastical insurance wide portfolio of risks as a specialist insurer and uh, we have our own in-house um, team of around 50 trained and professionally qualified um, surveyors operating on a regional basis and as part of my role I'm responsible for the training and the development of that team alongside delivery of risk guidance and tools to our customers. Moving on to Moving on to um, the topic for today, water leaks, let's consider the scale of the problem. So um, you can see uh, some API reported loss data at £930 million pounds, um, in claims paid out during 2018, which uh, uh, equated to 287,000 uh, claims through the year. So that's, if you break that down, that's 24,000 claims um, every month and around 5,500 claims a week. Um, and looking at those claim costs, um, insurers have seen around a 40 to 50 increase in um, the cost of to damage claims over the last six years. Um, so you know, both the frequency and the cost of water leak damage is uh, And I think it's fair to say the majority of losses are occurring in the commercial space, although as you can see, 80% losses also in the residential sector. Um, that equates to a £1.8 million pound payout on a daily basis for escape of water in a domestic setting. Um, and if we look at uh, the position with the um, UNA office scheme, um, almost 40% of the claims that have been reported to us through the, claim, through the scheme have actually been in respect of um, water leaks. So um, let's just um, pause on the, on the statistics for uh, a moment and um, consider a brief case study um, linked to an occupancy. So um, the scenario I just wanted to run through was uh, a family that have left their property for an extended winter break. Um, the property dated from the 1970s and was a traditional brick built um, hatched building. And it was actually the postman uh, turning up with the mail one day that discovered the leak, um, was greeted with water running uh, out of the front door. 
so clearly the leak had been running for some time. Ceilings to the property had collapsed and contents within the property heavily um, contaminated. The uh, repair costs for the damage were uh, estimated to be in excess of £50,000. Um, so I think you can see from that that um, on occupancy is clearly a key contributing factor um, when it comes to water leaks, um, but also um, you know, the extent of damage uh, isn't to be taken lightly. Uh, you know, a leak from a normal water pipe, uh, as it says there, uh, can release around 2,000 gallons of water a day, uh, and the problem can be exacerbated where you've got concealed pipe work, which can delay the detection, the early detection of any leak, uh, uh, hence you know, uh, greater damage uh, likely to be uh, encountered. So um, if we look at some of the um, risk factors uh, to um, consider when we're assessing the, the risk of water leak, occupancy um, is, is clearly a factor. We've just touched on, on occupancy and, and the increased risks where we've got an unoccupied property. Um, you know, empty properties are more prone to water leak. Um, the heating may not be uh, operating as uh, an increased risk of potential freeze and burst pipes. Um, if it's a long-term occupied property, then potentially it may be targeted by um, thieves and perhaps looking at um, stealing the copper pipe work. Um, you know, other things in terms of occupancy, uh, is it multi-tenure in occupation? So uh, that potentially might lead to uh, complex pipe works, sanitary fittings within the uh, property. Um, you know, services to individual ten ten tenants within the building. Um, so quite simply, you know, the more pipe work uh, there is in a, in a property uh, or complex system, um, the more likely uh, there is to be uh, greater the risk of leak in the building. Um, and if there is a leak, you know, where it's going to be tenured, all the tenants in the property know um, where the stop clock and the isolation valves um, in the building are, and can they access them uh, to isolate the supply um, quickly if it needs to be. Um, the type of occupancy also has a bearing in terms of um, you know the fit out within within the property so in the context of your office risks you know think about those critical systems that, that you might have uh, within the building or any high value um, contents that might be affected by uh, a water leak. Um, have you perhaps computer servers located beneath tanks or pipe work and, and if so could they be relocated to uh, a less vulnerable area if you share your property with other tenants um you know um what the position is with their their, their services um and a potential for leak obviously water travels uh, so a leaking neighboring property could could absolutely impact um, your operations um so um looking at age of the property um we've done our own analysis around uh claims and um, we found that 60% of water leaks occurred in properties that were over 50 years old. Um, and the costs that were associated with repairs in those older properties um, was around 50% higher. So you know, the age of the pipework is clearly a factor. Um, it's likely to be copper where it's uh, sort of 50 years old and you're going to get corrosion and wear and tear over time. That could lead to things like input uh, leaks. Um, so you get that gradual leak of water over time, which may not be detected immediately, um, particularly where the pipe has been sealed um, and the damage can be can be significant. Um, you know, we, we estimate from a, based on a, a report we did last year that over 76 percent of the UK housing stock is, is pre-1975. Um, so you can see there is a considerable exposure there when it comes to, to property. Uh, and when it comes to construction, um, you know, is the property built of traditional construction? So uh, by that I mean brick and stone, or is it is it perhaps uh, a modern a modern building using modern methods of construction like timber frame and, and cladding that may be less resilient to um, water penetration than the more traditional built building? So you know, these are factors that you need to consider when assessing your your risk of uh, water leaks and and indeed the extent of damage that you might anticipate should a leak. So um, looking at some other risk factors, um, 
found that those buildings that are purpose built are less prone to water leak than those that have been converted and adapted for a change in use. Um, converted property generally results in more complex pipe work, um, possibly including the use of plastic pipe work and push fittings. Um, and our experience shows that plastic pipe work and, 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 and uh, those type of push fittings are more prone to failure as well as less resilient to um, pressure, pressure, sorry, fluctuations and thermal changes within the system. And this can lead to joints opening, you know, differential movement uh, in the pipe work, including within uh, soil pipes. The soldered joints are, are much more robust. Um, most pipe work failure occurs at the point of a joint. So as I said earlier, you know, the more complex the system, the more joints there are likely to be and hence greater risk of, of of a, of a leak. Um, and where you've got underfloor uh, heating, fire suppression or sprinkler systems in a building, then they can all pose a risk of leaks um, within the building. Uh, so I talked about where pipe works enclosed, um, making it more difficult to identify a leak in the early stages. Um, there's also the risk of uh, or increased risk of mechanical damage to pipe work. Um, so you know somebody drilling or nailing into the wall and inadvertently hitting that that pipe work uh, and generating a leak um, from a maintenance point of view um, think about the, the pipe work and insulation so if it's poorly insulated or it's been inappropriately used um, so perhaps things being hung off the pipe work and if it's not designed to be a hanging rail you know these can all increase the risk of, of damage and ultimately um, a, a leak uh, from, from the pipe work um, when it comes to building management, uh, clearly uh, reactive maintenance, uh, maintenance to a system is going to be a poor feature. Um, pipe work does need to be routinely inspected by a competent person, um, otherwise significant losses uh, can occur. Um, and when you're thinking about that maintenance and inspection regime, um, don't forget about sealants. Um, you know, we, we um, have a number of losses uh, where is you know, linked to sealant failure. So where you've got washrooms, um, make sure you pick up on those uh, aspects as well. Um, the loss history is, is a good indicator uh, of um, potential problems around um, uh, water leaks. So you know if there have been previous leaks within the property, then then statistically um, you're more likely to experience um, uh, further leaks. Um, you know if we think about what I was saying about the age of the, uh, the property and, and the condition of the pipework. Um, if you've got older copper pipe work which has started to corrode and deteriorate, if you've had one pinprick leak there, then the chances are there are going to be others in, in the pipe work um, in, in due course. Um, we can't uh, avoid or, 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 or forget about weather. So again, clearly, clearly a factor when it comes to uh, the risk of water leaks, um, you know, where, where there's freezing temperatures. Um, is the pipe work adequately insulated or you know do you have appropriate trace heating um, to to try and uh, avoid that freeze scenario along of course with regular servicing and maintenance maintenance of any heating equipment within the property and um, finally in terms of risk factors um, we shouldn't overlook contractors um, the insurance sector has found that you know, the most common cause of water leaks is poor workmanship so you know it is critical that you um you select and appoint competent contractors to to work on um on, on pipe work and, uh, and do plumbing works for you so um i just wanted to talk a little bit about braided hose connectors um been a particular source of uh, water leaks for us um, and we're seeing an increase in the use of um Hose connectors connected to white good goods in a property like dishwashers, um, and, and I think the issue has been linked to uh, import of substandard um, hose connectors, uh, where, as you can see from the slide, the um, the content of chromium and nickel is is below the level that it should be, uh, leading to degrade, debrading and corrosion of the uh, connector and an early failure. Um, so, you know, where you've got hose connectors in properties, and make sure you know, as part of your inspection and maintenance regime, you are um, periodically checking those out uh, and the condition of those hose connectors and, and clearly swapping out any substandard um, hoses that you might identify. 
So um, moving on to another brief uh, case study. Um, I highlighted earlier the complexity of pipe work, um, plastic pipe work and four workmanship as three risk factors to, to consider. Um, in this case study, what we've got is an underfloor heating system using um, plastic pipe and the pipe work was enclosed uh, and unfortunately it was damaged by contractors working on the floor. Um, the leak ran undetected for some time, saturating the floor slab and extensive work was required to dry out and make good damage. Um, unfortunately, there was no leak detection system fitted on this occasion. Um, so um, just moving on, having identified some of the key risk factors, um, let's just think about some of the steps that you could try to take to uh, manage those risks. Um, I think the first point is that, you know, whilst leak detection is a great risk mitigation tool, clearly it's designed to operate when a leak's detected, so you've already got a problem. Um, so really, in terms of hierarchy, let's look at those controls that will hopefully um, prevent a loss from occurring in the first place before we move on to um, leak detection as um, risk mitigation tool. Um, so where pipe work is exposed and vulnerable to freezing, we've talked about um, insulating uh, the pipe work or introducing appropriate trace heating. Um, I would say you know, don't forget about any, any water tanks and roof voids as part of that, um, that exercise, uh, making sure they're appropriately lagged um, is important as well. If there, is a, if there is a leak, then make sure you know where the stopcock uh, to the system is and any other isolation valves uh, to the system so that you can isolate the supply as soon as possible. And um, remember to routinely exercise the stopcock um, to make sure that it's going to work when you uh, when you need it, it hasn't seized up effectively. Um, if you do spot a leak, then please, please um, do something about it straight away. Don't leave it. It will only get worse. Um, and you know, I would, I would um, extend that to include things like dripping taps. Um, you know, the temptation is just to tighten the tap to stop the drip, but um, if the seal uh, or the valve is starting to fail, then then um, it needs to be addressed um, sooner than later. Um, if you've got any drains and pipe work, uh, or, or you will have drains and pipe work, so um, you know, make sure that they're kept clear of any any blockages. Um, you know, so those are some simple, relatively simple steps that you can do that will make a big, big difference when it comes to um, trying to mitigate or, or prevent the risk of uh, water leaks occurring. Um, moving on to some other things that you can think about. Um, you know, don't forget about the external gutters and pipework to the property. They need to be routinely cleaned as well. Um, and I would suggest that's done on at least an annual basis ahead of the winter. Um, where a property is going to be left unoccupied for an extended period, um, then you know, isolate and drain down water systems where possible, or failing that, um, try and maintain the temperature at a minimum of uh, 10 degrees Celsius to prevent um, freezing of pipework. Um, if you've got any exposed pipework that might be vulnerable to um, accidental damage, then think about ways of um, protecting that, that that pipe work and when you've got those high value or, or sensitive items, um, you know, relocate them where they're um, away from, from pipe work and water tanks so that if there is a leak, um, you know, you, you're, you're reducing the risk of those items being damaged or, or, or you know, significant dis disruption to your, to your business. So um, another short case study um, to just run through. So this one um, occurred in the early hours of the morning where uh, pipe work started to leak in a commercial risk and the manager to that property um, was unaware how to shut off the water supply. So um, it continued to run until the fire brigade turned up um, and managed to isolate the water in the road several hours later. Um, and as you can imagine, the, uh, the amount of water that had run during that period and the extent of damage was significant. Um, you'll see you know, half a million pounds worth of damage and a subsequent interruption to the business of um, four months. Um, so you know, a significant loss occurred and that was largely, uh, I would say, down to the inability of the manager to shut off water. Um, and if the manager had known where the stopcock was, um, that loss would have been a fraction of the size. Um, so, you know, 
I would say to you, you know, are water leaks contemplated as part of your business continuity plan? Do you have a water management plan in place um, that signposts how you will um, mitigate any water leaks um, within your business premises? Um, when it comes to water mitigation plans, um, operating a wet work permit where work is being undertaken on, on a plumbing system is a very good idea. Um, permits used to control how work is completed um, on the life of the system with formal issue control and sign off of a permit by authorised and competent individuals. So very much uh, in the same vein as a hot work permit where you've got contractors using uh, heat on the premises. The permit sets out how the work's going to be under, uh, undertaken um, safely to manage the risk of leaks and uh, it, it may include risk mitigation measures, measures such as uh, the provision of wet, uh, wet vacs and bundling within the uh, work area. Um, we highlighted earlier poor workmanship uh, is a major contributing factor when it comes to uh, water leaks so as we see you know selection and use of competent contractors is going to be a uh, key to reducing that risk um, along with the selection and use of appropriate products uh, and in that in that context um, you know always try to use um, products that are WRRX um, approved products um, where work has been done on plumbing and water systems um, it should be completed in line with industry standards and regulations um, using suitably accredited contractors um, and, and we've got uh, water safe uh, the web website address is there um, as you see it's a national accreditation body provides a lot of helpful advice guidance around how to manage um, water systems and has a list of um, suitable accredited contractors that can support work on on water systems including members of the chartered institute of plumbing and heating contractors and the association of plumbing and heating contractors just as by way of an example of, of accreditation body um, plumbing and pipe work should be subject to routine inspection and maintenance and as we said earlier including those flexible hoses and those washroom sealants uh, where, they're, where they're a feature in your, in your premises. Um, other things to think about so um, you know, do you have plans and drawings for the pipe work in your property that will help with identification so when you're carrying out work you know where the pipe work is you can avoid or reduce at least the risk of accidental damage. Um, you know, whether a sprinkler system is installed, can they potentially be sw swapped over to an alternate dry system during the winter period to reduce the risk of freeze? Um, and during that winter period, you know, have you got frost protection fitted to your heating system? Uh, you can have a frost app that can be set to automatically turn off the heating um, when temperatures fall below uh, a set level. So, you know, we talked about 10 degrees Celsius earlier. Um, I mentioned business continuity planning, um, so again another question to you, do you does your business continuity plan um, contemplate water leaks and the action you might take to uh, to manage that um, scenario should it occur? Um, so something to think about um, if not already um, catered for. Um, so you know, we opened with mitigation measures and I talked about leak detection being um, you know something that's going to respond where a leak's already occurred rather than preventing it um so you know i'm going to end there on, on leak mitigation um and start to just talk a little bit about leak detection systems uh, that will help um reduce the damage caused um particularly where those systems are linked to um either remote alarm receiving centers or a building management system so um, looking at leak detection in a bit more detail, there are two main types of system, um, leak detection and flow detection systems. Um, leak detection involves the uh, detection of leaks from a, a, a local source, such as a pipe work or an appliance, and it can be either a spot detection um, type device that's sited in the near vicinity to the, the appliance or the pipe work, or it can be uh, linear detection um, designed to cover a larger area, so perhaps a ceiling um, above, uh, you know, a, 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 an office space where there's pipe work um, to cover that larger area, and pick up any, any potential leaks uh, coming through the ceiling, um, and, and you know, both both uh, spot detection and um, linear detection, um, if triggered, will then um, 
generate local alert. It may go through to an alarm receiving centre or link to a building management system. And in some cases, it can also isolate the uh, water supply to the um, to the prop to the to the, um, reducing the damage. Um, so the other alternative uh, that you might uh, want to consider is a flow detection system. And these operate by monitoring the uh, water flow rates through a system, uh, essentially looking for um, abnormal operating conditions. So, um, you know, protracted flow of water over a predetermined period of time, which then uh, triggers the system and isolates the water as, as well as, you know, potentially generating that, that local or remote alert as well. Um, Ecclesiastical uh, do have a preferred supplier facility with um, leak detection specialist uh, company called LeakSafe. Um, and we can let you have further details um, around that if you're interested. Uh, they can also be found um, on the Ecclesiastical website. Uh, preferred supplier facilities are available to our policyholders at um, discounted rates. So uh, please go and have a look at the website and that preferred um, supplier offering if it's uh, of interest to you. So um, finally, let's just think about what to do if the worst happens. Um, so clearly, I think turn off the water supply at the main stop block as soon as you can. We've, we've um, been through the case study where that was delayed and we've seen the extent of the damage that was caused as a consequence. Turn off your electrics and your heating. Um, try and drain down the system if it's safe to do so. So open up the taps. Um, and if you can remove contents that are potentially at risk of damage, then then move them to a safe area. Um, you know, and, and contact your, your broker um, and also us as your insurer uh, or your insurance company if you're not with an ecclesiastical to, to register that that claims uh, that claim with the claims department. So um, that was really um, what I wanted to cover off in the context of water leaks. I did say at the start that we would spend a little bit of time just talking about um, building valuation. Um, so I, I just uh, talked through these points on the last slide. Um, but you know, it is vital that building some insured um, does accurately reflect the cost of reinstating uh, the property uh, in, in the event of an insured loss. Um, any shortfall is clearly going to result in inadequate funds uh, from an insurance claims perspective to support uh, repairs and rebuild. Um, and your insurance policy is then not going to perform uh, in line with your expectations uh, when it comes to that loss. So um, you know, setting the correct sums insured is, is key. Um, the sum insured for the building uh, needs to reflect the rebuild costs uh, for the property you're, you're in, not the market value. Um, which is um, hardly ever the same thing. Um, you know, when it comes to reinstatement cost, factors that need to be considered will include the location of the property, um, including ease of access uh, for contractors uh, coming on site. Um, in terms of location, you know, we see some regional variances. So costs typically for buildings in the south of the country are going to be higher than in the north, uh, particularly so um, in the London area. Um, you know, where there are access issues, so restricted access um, problems, and that's likely to add cost, to the overall build cost, um, you know, extra um, contingency required for storage materials um, and, and longer time to complete reinstatement. So it could have an impact on your um, business operations in terms of the delay as well. The materials are the buildings built of are going to have a bearing, so brick is cheaper than stone, um, by way of an example. Um, and if the materials are, are specialist in nature, then that may attract specialist um, labour skills um, that, that will come at, at an additional cost. And again, you know, likely to be in high demand, so it could take you longer to, to source a contractor to, um, to support that reinstatement work. Um, think about decorative features within the uh, property. You know, where you've got highly ornate um, buildings with ornate uh, plasterwork, um, decorative um, stonework, and other ornamental features, then they can all add cost uh, to, to the rebuild of the property. Um, economies of scale also come into play. So, the larger the building uh, that you're in, um, the lower the, the cost 
per square meter is likely to be to, to rebuild the property. Um, and that's simply because you, know, you can have multiple trades that can work on the property uh, at the same time. Um, if you're in a historic or a listed building, um, then you know, back to my point around specialist labor skills are likely to be required and that can add to the uh, reinstatement cost of the building. Um, finally, don't overlook the VAT status of the property. Um, if, if the property owner is uh, VAT registered, then um, it may be that you can exclude allowance for VAT, the building sum insured, otherwise you know, suitable allowance needs to be included for VAT along with professional fees within the building sum insured. Um, so apologies again for the technical problems at the beginning. I hope you found the uh, workshop informative um, and uh, I think if we can now turn to your question. Thank you very much, David. Um, and uh, yeah, let, let's um, have a look at uh, the question. I've got one here in particular says, um, a client says they have a partial flat roof, which they believe is a higher risk of water damage. How frequently should they be having that roof inspected? Um, Bobby, do we have any questions? Hello, can you hear me? Hi, David. Can you hear me? Hello? We seem to have some technical problems again. I'm not sure if anyone can hear me. Um, Thank you, David. And it looks like David Parkinson may have dropped off. Um, we did have a question relating to how frequently a flat roof should be inspected. And I think we will let that question, we'll get back to um, the the person with that question specifically based on um, the guidance that we have from Ecclesiastical on that. Um, I would obviously have liked to have thanked David Parkinson for his insights and his time today. Obviously, thanks to the attendees. From Kuna Mutual's perspective, we, as we've been working with credit unions on this particular area and these particular risks, we have seen um, some real issues around the uh, market value versus the rebuilding cost of properties and it's um, really important that um, we do take those points that David made in consideration as we try and establish what the correct value is to have on our insurance programmes and we work with credit unions to help them assess those things where we can. Um, we worked with a credit union last year who had purchased a property um, <clears throat> and managed to secure that property at a very low cost um, in relation to the property um, as it had been a disused bank. And that's that I know that's something that's been happening up and down the country as banks close their branches. Um, however, the cost of the rebuild for that property was um, something like 10 times the value that the credit union had secured the property for. So it was really important that they're aware of that um, as they as they work out how to make sure that they're adequately insured, as David said. David, thank you for coming back on. I think I hope you can hear me now. Perhaps not, perhaps not, David. Um, the gremlins that we have all experienced, um, technical gremlins that we've all experienced during the past 12 months of this pandemic. Um, <clears throat> Look, I, think I, I, I can't. Can you hear me? Oh, hi, David. Yes, I can hear you now. Hi, apologies. Um, continued technical uh, issues at my end, so apologies once again. Um, hopefully everybody. Sorry, 
Sorry, Bobby. No, thank you, David. Um, yes, th thanks for joining us, uh, for coming back on. Um, as I had mentioned, we did have a question which related to how frequently a credit union should have their property inspected if they have a partial flat roof in particular, how frequently should the roof be inspected? Have you got any thoughts or insights into that? Yeah, I think I think the, um, the the gremlins are indeed with us. And my apologies to everyone in attendance for that. Um, but we will get back to you with um, the answer to those questions, particularly um, as you come in, into the period of time as you look to um, renew your insurances. Then the flat roof question is is an important one, and we do provide guidance on that as we work with you to provide quotations um, for your property in that in that regard. Um, <clears throat> and there is certainly extra. Um, precaution that should be taken wherever you've established that there is potential. Well, wait, just to... Unfortunately, David, I think you're cutting in and out, so um, I think we will, um, as I suggest, leave it there, unfortunately, but um, thank you very much for your time and your insights today. Um, all it remains for me to say is that you know Cuny Mitchell is committed to the credit union sector and particularly to help you um, make sure that you have the right cover for the right risks at the, at the right price and um, we work with you uh, to establish that you've got everything that you need to be confident that you've mitigated um, the risks that we hope never happen but it's important that you have the protection if and when they do. So please get in touch with myself or Dara We've given you the um, contact details and this um, presentation will be coming out to you via our um, email channels, so you will have a copy of this for review as and when you wish to. I'll leave it at that and thank you all very much for your time and have a good weekend when it comes. Best wishes.